Good morning. It's great to see you guys. How many are glad it's, it's drier inside than it is outside today? Not feeling very much like Christmas. I was out walking last night. It was like 55 degrees. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're actually beginning our Christmas series, even though this is the second week of Christmas Advent, beginning our Christmas series today. We're going to talk about how, how is it possible for joy to break into an anxious world. Because you probably have noticed people are a little wound a little tight and they're, they're frustrated and upset and worried about many things. And so is it possible for joy to break into our world in conditions like this? And the greatest resource to, uh, to examine for this is actually the original Christmas story. So we're going to be in Luke's Gospel, first chapter, beginning in verse 26. And it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Would you repeat that sentence with me? For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What does it take uh, for you to experience joy? Uh, does something have to be easy? Does something have to be pain-free? Does something have to be uncomplicated? Does something have to be completed? Does something need to make sense? And of course, the answer is, if we think about that for more than a minute, is those are not requirements for the experience of joy. We all have stories of joy that, that didn't require us to, to be in a situation that was easy. Uh, for example, if you're in school and the subject matter you are studying is, is hard and challenging, complicated and difficult, and you study like crazy and, and you walk into a final exam or you're sitting down to write your final essay and you're not very confident that you actually understand the material, you can still get a good grade when, when you see that grade, you will experience some joy. Or, or perhaps you're running a marathon. How many here has ever run a marathon? That's about right, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you're going to run a marathon, you, you'll limit your dietary intake. People who run marathons don't eat like I eat. And uh, it's just true. And, and then the, there's training that they do every day and certain amount of, of running that they need to put in and, and weight work and all the things that they do. And, and quite honestly, that's limiting and sometimes painful, but when they cross the finish line of the marathon, they experience joy. Uh, confusion doesn't inhibit joy. It, it, it can coexist with joy. So sometimes we experience joy because we've been invited to something. We've been included in something. 
You get invited to the dance. You get invited to the movie. You get invited to the party. You get invited to a conversation that's actually significant and matters. You, you get invited to participate in a decision that's going to actually make a difference. You never know what might be a joy carrier. We, we can't tell just by looking. But joy is very rarely the only emotion we experience at the same time. So we can be glad we're invited to the party, but we can be worried that we're going to screw it up when we get there. And I know some of you are wondering, are pastors allowed to say, screw it up on Sunday in church? I don't know. <laughs> I'm worried about that. We can, be, <laughs> we can be glad to be included in a decision, but we can be worried we're going to make the wrong decision. We can worry about so many things. I wonder what percentage of worry in our life is actually about what other people think of us. Because technically, that's what social anxiety is. We're, we're worried about what others think. And the birth of Christ kind of breaks into this model of and this operating system and challenges us in ways we're not expecting to be challenged. Uh, of course, the birth of Christ story is one that's been toned down over the ages. It's filled full of drama and excitement and is filled full of poverty and embarrassment. It is the kind of story that even if it were not true, would be something that people would read over and over again. There's one other thing that it's filled with and that's joy. How can this be? Anxiety and joy are not mutually exclusive. Joy doesn't require ideal conditions, and neither does God. That's a takeaway for us today. You might think, well, my, my situation is not as it should be. That's all right. You can experience joy. Let's just do a little poll this morning. How many, if it were, if it were possible for you today, you wouldn't mind feeling a little joy this Christmas season? Yeah, see, right there. And, but does that mean... All your Christmas shopping needs to be done? No. Does that mean that, that you have everything all in place and planned out? No. Joy can break into our situations. It doesn't require a perfect situation. So God sends an angel named Gabriel to Nazareth. Nazareth, that's not a spiritual epicenter anywhere. On the map, it's about 60 miles away from Jerusalem. We can cover that distance in about an hour. It would take someone walking a good three days. Uh, you would expect that an angel would show up in a place where there's kind of a history of spiritual experiences, where people have made connections to God. A place where there's a significant spiritual edifice, a, a temple, so, something that people are attracted to and gravitate to. Nazareth was on no one's map and on no one's agenda except God. God sends an angel to Nazareth and to a person named Mary. The Bible tells us two things about Mary. One is that she was engaged. This is a season when some people expect such things. I just made some of you worry. The Bible tells us that she was engaged, and the Bible tells us that she was a virgin. And of course, this challenges our sense of credibility. Why does that have to be in there? Why couldn't God just pick a baby that's already born and make him into Jesus? And that's the thing about us, is, is that we want a God to do things in a way that we're completely comfortable with, but accomplish things that we can't do on our own. And so we create this internal conflict. Why not for God to use just any child? And the answer is God wants us to know right away that what will happen is his doing. It's his doing. Interestingly enough, we have no description of the angel. We don't know how tall the angel was. We don't know how much the angel weighed. We don't know if this was a winged angel or a wingless angel. We don't... We don't know any of that. We don't even know how Mary understood that this was an angel. The angel delivers a message 
The message is basically you are highly favored and the Lord is with you. And Mary's reaction, is she completely at peace? Does she feel sudden calm? Is she infused with boldness? None of the above. She is troubled. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. She is troubled. Why? Because there's something about her circumstances that doesn't match what she's hearing. If I were to tell you today, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Some of you would go, yep, I, I believe that. Some of you would go, eh, you're probably talking to somebody else. Life was not easy in the ancient world, and Mary couldn't resolve what she was hearing with the situation that she was experiencing in life. She might even have asked herself internally, so this is what favor looks like? What does favor mean? It's undeserved generosity. When you do a favor for someone, it's not because they've earned it. It's going above and beyond. It's, it's to be given an advantage. Not because you've earned it, but because someone wants to help or bless you. We tend to be troubled when God's word contradicts our experience. That's true. We tend to be troubled when God's word contradicts our experience. We tend to dismiss the idea that we are favored. And we've got evidence to support that. Evidence from our past and evidence from the present. But when God says we're favored, he's not just looking at where we have been or where we are. God can see the future and God knows things we don't know. And when he says you're favored, that should be a reason for joy and hope right there. And that's what he tells us. Now, Mary is anxious because of the angel's response. He's, she's not anxious because she saw an angel. It says she was troubled at his words. And the angel tells her not to be afraid, which is what all angels have to tell people when they show up. But he, it's not because of his appearance. She's troubled by his words. And what we're seeing right here is a rare insight into the operating system of God. We're seeing a prototype of how God works in people's lives. And there's a lot to learn from examining this story. Being open to miracles is an act of resistance. Because our world will constantly try to convince you that nothing is ever going to change. Nothing is ever going to get better. You should accept things, that the real peace found in our world is just to accept things as they are, to accept that things are always going to be increasingly limiting. And if you can just sign off on that, you will feel better. Please understand this. What Mary is going to do and what God calls us to do is not to deny reality, but to be able to incorporate something that helps us resist the trajectory of the world in our lives. And that's different. So, miracles. Miracles are conceived and carried before they are delivered. This is part of the prototype, right? Miracles happen to unlikely people. Mary wasn't anybody anybody knew. We wouldn't have known who she was if she wasn't included in the biblical story. Miracles seem sometimes to be ordinary. She's having a baby, not a unicorn. <laughs> Miracles take time. How long does it take for a miracle baby to be born. You're going to be surprised at this. Nine months. Mary was not sleeping in bed one night and woke up to the baby laying in bed next to her. That's not the definition of a miracle. By the way, when Mary was pregnant, do you think she had morning sickness? Hmm? Heartburn. Back pain. Interrupted sleep, labor, 
All of those things. We don't have anything in scripture that indicates to us that she was spared anything of the natural development of a child inside of a mother's womb. But we are still told that this is God in a miracle at work. Mary didn't go to sleep and just wake up with a baby. Completely normal pregnancy. And yet a miracle is occurring. Naivete is not required for miracles. Mary wasn't a naive person, and God doesn't require you to be a naive person in order for him to do some of his very best work. Mary knows that this piece of information she is being given could end, could end her engagement. She knows that if she tells family and friends that she's pregnant and she's not yet married, there's going to be slander and there's going to be gossip. Virtually no one else will know what's going on in her life. The passage ends by telling us that the angel left her. Wouldn't it have been just better for the angel to walk around with her? And, and, and when she says, I'm pregnant, but it's from the Holy Spirit, and people are going, oh, <laughs> what do you expect? And the angel goes, you better believe it. <laughs> Wouldn't have that been easier. But no, the angel's gone. There's no halo over Mary's head. Like this is completely normal in every way. And she understands, she's not naive. If I say yes to this, all of that is going to be part of my experience. Why would she say yes? Because it was worth it. Our world is increasingly coming to a position that believes that facing challenges, difficulties, all of those things are not worth what God might do in our lives. So what does Mary decide? She says, how is this possible? That's a fair question. Mary knows there's no way for her to be pregnant. She hasn't had sex with anyone. And the angel tells her that the Holy Spirit will come on her and God's power will overshadow her. I love this imagery because even the shadow of God passing over our lives can create incredibly new things for us to walk into and experience. Some of us think that lightning has to flash from heaven. We have to be thrashed around the room by some kind of spiritual force. And our eyes have to be opened to see all the glories of heaven itself for anything to happen. Just a shadow, <laughs> just a shadow from God is enough to create brand new life in each and every one of us. It's, it's amazing. This is how something holy will be born. How often do we assume that our inadequacies or our inexperience will, will keep us from, from ever having anything of God's life flow in us? God wants her to know, what is going to be produced in you is from him. He just simply invites us to participate. He's the one who does the work. I don't remember who said it, but the work is his, the privilege of participation is ours. He invites us. God's invitation comes to you. God wants to grow something in your life. God wants to grow something through your life that will make a difference in the world around you. And the thing is, is that we cannot calculate the kind of difference this can make. Our world is kind of bought into the notion that real difference is made by people who are the most famous, the celebrities, the most powerful, people who hold high office, the, the, the most, the, the, the richest, the wealthiest, that the people who have the most resources, that these are the people who make the real difference. I don't know who the rich people were, and I only know the names of a few of the powerful people back when Mary was born, but I can tell you there's no one who's had the, the kind of uh, effect on our world that her son Jesus had. In an out-of-the-way place to a girl that nobody knew, and look what God was able to do with it. Not only a change for individuals, but sometimes for entire generations, if we are willing to allow the life of God to come into us. Yeah. So Mary says, yes, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled just as you have said. 
Now it's easy to get distracted by the messenger and miss the message. What's happening? She's being given an invitation. She's invited. She's included. She's being invited to the dance. She's being given a lead role in the play. She is, she is being given agency to decide if she will participate with God or not. And in that moment, the room was thick with opportunity, not obligation. A lot of times we wait for a sense of obligation and we bypass the opportunities that God has for us. Have you ever been in a space like that? If you continue to read on in the chapter, you'll find that Mary sings a song. My soul does magnify the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She's going to have to share some news with people that she loves and they're going to have a very difficult time understanding it. And yet, and yet, her spirit rejoices in God, her Savior. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. So where do you need a miracle in your life? Maybe it's a health situation. Because that can be a real thing. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe for you heading into this Christmas season, uh, you don't look forward to it at all. Either because you're going to have to interact with someone you would rather avoid or you know someone won't be around that you wish for all the world the relationship would be restored. You're dreading the days that lie ahead. And what I want you to know is that you can't cause things to happen. Maybe the miracle you need is a financial one. Maybe you've burned through savings and, and the numbers aren't adding up. And uh, maybe you've already surrendered to the notion that we're just going to have one big Christmas and then deal with a mess afterwards. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe for you when the alarm goes off, there are days you cannot find the strength or the interest in getting out of bed. It's just too hard. And you don't even understand it yourself. You can remember days when, not that you were an early bird necessarily, but one foot went in front of the other without any effort. And now it takes more strength than you have sometimes. Maybe it's a mission. Your life just seems full of tedium. Stuff that doesn't matter. Stuff that makes no difference. Hmm. What do you need? You need a miracle. Now don't get me wrong. If suddenly the ground beneath us began to shake and angels surrounded the perimeters of the property that we're in and heavenly lights began to flash and a booming voice that sounded nothing like mine began to declare good things to you. That'd be a lot of fun. But the story of Mary tells us that it doesn't have to be that way. That right now in this moment, at this time, if you are in need of a miracle, and maybe you've even surrendered to the idea that nothing in your life can change. Listen to the words of God to you today. You are highly favored and the Lord is with you. And he's about to do something in your life that if you even had an inkling of it, it would cause you to wonder how it is possible and you would be able to rejoice with great joy. Our act of worship 
is an act of defiance in a culture that claims natural causes for everything. I don't know how God is going to do all that he's going to do, but his Holy Spirit can still come upon us and his power can still overshadow us and his life can still be found in us. And how many would like to find out what a future looks like when that's possible? Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning.